low, medium, or high frequency? What is the right frequency when we go fishing that we have to pick and choose? It seems like a trivial question, but it really isn't. There are many aspects that, in my opinion, are very important to evaluate, and therefore, I decided to make this video in which I really want to explain the various differences between the types of frequencies. Why use one frequency instead of another? And what are the most important aspects you need to know? Obviously to go fishing. There are two types of transducers, monotone or chirp. The speech is a little different depending on whether we are talking about chirp fish finders or monotone fish finders, but we will see the main differences together. How important is frequency first? Frequency is very important, and it is absolutely necessary to know what are the parameters that make us choose one frequency over another. What is frequency? Frequency is basically the pulse tone that is emitted from our fish finder through the transducer. It can be a low tone, then low frequency, up to the highest tones, high frequency. Frequencies are measured in kilohertz. As for our transducers, they start at a minimum of 2428 kilohertz. I'm talking about professional transducers. They usually start at 50 or 40 kilohertz and go up to 200, 220 kilohertz. This is the range in which our transducer usually works. Echo sounders that also have side scan or down vision also use much higher frequencies. And later we will see why such high frequencies must be used, what advantages they have, and what disadvantages. We have said the first substantial difference. We need to understand if we have an echo sounder with relative chirp or monotone transducer, because chirp echo sounders work in a very different way with chirp transducers. They have a swap type emission, i.e. the frequency is not emitted on a single tone, but is precisely placed on a band of frequencies. I'll leave you the link to the video above if you don't know these differences, I suggest you watch it anyway because it will clarify your ideas on the difference between monotone and chirp much better. You can see immediately if a transducer is chirp or monotone from the technical characteristics and from the AirMar data sheet. In this case, like this one I put on your screen. As you can see, we have a wide band which is drawn in green, which corresponds to the high frequency of a B265LH. And we have a narrow band, which you see has this shape with a pointed tip, which instead concerns a probe, which is not chirp, it is a B260. Still on the high frequency side, the chirp probes can be used in two ways. We can use them in chirp, and therefore by giving impulses that contain all the frequencies included from low to high frequency, therefore with a band in this case of 80 key arts, or by setting our echo sounder, we are going to choose a frequency included within this band. There are obviously advantages and disadvantages. It depends on what we have to do with our probe according to the chosen frequency. We will see that we can get different performance from our tools. First of all, let's talk about monotone transducers. We see that from a physical point of view, the lower the frequency, the more serious it is. Therefore, the closer we get to 50 kilohertz in, the more it will be able to cross the water, and therefore it will go deeper. A higher frequency, 110, 130, 180, or 200 kilohertz, will be attenuated much more by the water, so we will be able to go shallower. In the graph that I have put here on the side of the screen, you can see the functioning of a B260 and compared to a B744. Both are one kilowatt probes, but as you can see, the B744 has a much wider cone than the B260 on both high and low frequencies, and for this reason, it can go less deep. On the other hand, however, the 50 kilohertz of the probe always goes much deeper than the 200 kHz part, even if both in this case are 1 kilowatt. So let's evaluate this graph better. The B260 reaches 3,000 feet. This means about 1,000 meters. We are talking about maximum viewing in ideal conditions and only as regards the background structure. 
The B-744 gets to about 1,500 feet than half. This reason is mostly because the cone is much wider in the B-744 and actually has a different sensitivity as well. It has less gain than the B-260. The same thing goes for the high frequency part. The B-744 has a wider cone than the B-260 and therefore will be able to go shallower. The frequency in the definition of targets and structures. In monotonic probes, the definition is mainly given by the frequency. The higher the frequency, the greater the detail. This happens because the wavelength of a low frequency is longer than a wavelength of a high frequency. We are able to display detail on our echo sounder proportionally to the wavelength. If you have a wavelength of 10 centimeters, our maximum detail will be 10 centimeters. If we use a higher frequency, the wavelength will be, for example, 5 centimeters, so the detail will be 5 centimeters. This, therefore, means that the lower the frequency, the more detail we lose, even if we go deeper. As for the structures, it's a slightly different matter, where frequency has nothing to do with it, but rather the angle of radiation. If we want to conduct an accurate analysis of the seabed, especially when dealing with relatively shallow depths, we are limited to using low frequencies at greater depths. However, in medium and shallow depths, we have the flexibility to choose between high and low frequencies. In this scenario, using high frequency allows us to capture finer details of the seabed, enhancing our ability to discern rocks and crevasses. High frequency signals produce a smaller shadow cone, which you can learn more about in the video I provided. However, in the case of chirp, the rule that high frequency offers more detail than low frequency does not apply. In chirp, the irradiation angle plays a significant role but not in defining the resolution. Chirp operates differently from conventional frequency-based methods, as I mentioned in the video I previously shared. It doesn't rely on frequency for precise target identification. Instead, it uses the pulse compression technique, which provides a distinct peak, enabling precise location and definition of the target on the seabed. Usually, echo sounders offer the option to select either the chirp or monotone operating mode within the same transducer. In this case, a transducer with a bandwidth, for example, ranging from 150 to 200 kilohertz, allows us to choose specific frequencies, such as 150, 160, 180, or 200 kilohertz. I don't recommend manually selecting specific frequencies because it typically results in a loss of detail. This feature is only particularly useful in specific situations, such as certain types of fishing like tuna drifting. If my primary goal is to locate tuna fish, I can opt for the lowest frequency available on my transducer. This choice makes the target appear slightly thicker, which improves visibility, especially for distant targets. Thus, for identifying deep targets, particularly large fish, a single frequency can often offer better visibility than chirp. However, at limited depths, say within 40 to 50 meters, this effect doesn't apply and chirp can be used without any issues. Here's an example of a transducer that operates within the range of 33 to 60 kilohertz, where you can observe significant differences by adjusting the operating frequency. When set to 70 kilohertz, the level of detail is notably lower, offering limited resolution due to signal limitations and amplification issues. On the other hand, at 60 kHz shown in this section, the targets, including the seabed, exhibit much better visibility. The red band on the screen is relatively thick, indicating a clearer and more detailed display. As we reduce the operating frequency further, we can observe an increase in the thickness of the red band on the display. Why does this thickness increase? It's because our transducer's beam angle narrows as the frequency increases and widens as the frequency decreases. A wider beam angle illuminates more of the background, which is what the red band represents, everything above the seabed. So keep in mind that the red band is essentially a visualization of what's above the seabed. There's a video available on the channel where I explain this effect in great detail. We consistently discuss the concept of the shadow cone and its relation to the red band. So, when you increase the frequency, the red band narrows, but when you decrease it, the band widens. Typically, the cone, or in this case, the red band, 
widens. Some probes, such as the B275LH wide, have a fixed cone angle on the high frequency end. This means that the width of the band remains constant, regardless of the specific frequency chosen within the operating range of that transducer. As I mentioned earlier, both the frequency and the angle of the radiation cone play a crucial role. Lower frequencies result in wider cones, as I've just explained. The accompanying graphs clearly illustrate the substantial difference between low and high frequencies. You can observe that the lower part, representing the seabed, is considerably wider. Now, when we're dealing with significant depths, such as over 400 meters, high frequencies are not recommended. They won't effectively locate targets at such depths. Even if we're using a 3KW transducer, it's much more advantageous to opt for the low frequency, as it provides a higher number of targets and better definition. Research has led to the development of echo sounders capable of discerning the types of fish within our water column based on the frequency response. Typically, larger fish exhibit better reflection at lower frequencies, while smaller fish are more detectable at higher frequencies. This practical knowledge means that, for instance, a fishing boat targeting sardines will often opt for high frequencies, while a vessel pursuing larger fish, like tuna, will choose lower frequencies. Squids tend to have an optimal resonant frequency in the range of 110-130 kHz, but I can assure you that for recreational fish finders, the difference in performance between low and high frequencies isn't as significant. Squid can be effectively detected using both low and high frequencies. What truly matters is setting up our depth sounder correctly which involves fine-tuning clutter, gain, and shift, essential functions for defining targets accurately on our fish finder. Equally important is ensuring that no external disturbances like noise from the live well pump, generator, inverter, or other onboard equipment interfere with the echo sounder. Such disturbances force us to keep the gain at a low level to maintain a clean screen but this may result in losing visibility of weaker targets like squid. Therefore, it's crucial to maintain a well-designed and noise-free system to operate with a high-gain setting and consistently highlight challenging targets such as squid. When deciding between single-frequency or dual-frequency operation, it's important to determine whether your echo sounder is equipped with a single transmission channel or if it's a dual-channel echo sounder. The distinction is crucial, especially when using probes like the P66 or B45, which offer both 50 and 200 kHz frequencies. Examples of such echo sounders include the Furuno FCV628, FCV588, or the GP1971 series, which feature a single transmission channel. These probes incorporate a diplexer, requiring the echo sounder to transmit on the low frequency first and then the high frequency, repeating this sequence. Consequently, this reduces the refresh rate and scrolling speed by half, resulting in a single pulse for each frequency. This reduction means a loss of many details. Therefore, for fish finders with a single transmission channel and probes like the P66 or B45, which do not have a built-in diplexer and work one channel at a time, it's best to select a single frequency, either the low or the high frequency, and use only that frequency. It's important to note that chirp probes operate somewhat differently. If your sonar unit operates with a single channel, it's best suited for one-channel chirp operation. However, if you have a two-channel chirp echo sounder and pair it with a two-channel probe like the B265LH or B275LHW, both channels can be utilized simultaneously, ensuring no slowdown in screen scrolling. With this setup, you'll consistently maintain an even flow on the screen whether you choose to use a single frequency or both frequencies. Earlier, I mentioned that side vision and down vision systems generally operate at higher frequencies. I'll explain why this is the case. The transducers responsible for emitting these frequencies come in various physical sizes. Lower frequencies require larger transducer elements, which in turn result in wider emission beams. 
To address this issue, one approach is to incorporate multiple elements arranged in parallel and series within the transducer, allowing for the tightening of the emission cone. However, it's often more cost-effective to use smaller transducers, which have a physical characteristic that enables them to transmit higher frequencies rather than the lower ones. Another point to consider, as I mentioned earlier, is that higher frequencies lead to sharper definition of our targets and bottom structures. Consequently, a high frequency with a very narrow cone can effectively depict bottom structures. Down vision and side vision functions operate much like a blade, creating a wide cone of sonar imaging. In the case of side vision, it involves two transducers, one pointing to the right and the other to the left, each covering approximately 90 degrees with an extremely narrow cone extending from bow to stern, typically around 1-2 degrees, and a wide cone extending downward, roughly 90 degrees. Achieving this effect involves the use of several compact transducers aligned along a specific line, collectively transmitting a very thin blade. The combination of these signals is what we see on the screen. Downvision works in a similar manner, generating a narrow blade-like beam from stern to bow, while offering enough width to provide clear visibility of bottom structures. However, this high-frequency approach may result in some loss of visibility for fish. Small fish at a certain distance may appear as very small objects with high definition, almost reducing them to just a few pixels, making them nearly invisible. For this reason, it's not advisable to increase the definition too much when targeting fish. Higher definition is certainly beneficial for clear visualization of bottom structures like logs. However, when it comes to fish, it's better to opt for a slightly lower definition that provides a graphical representation of what you're observing. In other words, Consider this, a half kilogram fish at a distance of 100 meters would be proportionally quite small, making it challenging to spot with very high definition. On the contrary, if that half kilogram fish is depicted at a certain size, even at a distance of 100 meters, it becomes more visible.